evening to everyone. Good evening evening to everyone else. (laughs) It's a joy to be in God's house tonight, amen? Amen. I am super excited to be here. I'm so sorry for you all that were looking forward to seeing my wife. She's not here, unfortunately, Uh, but we do appreciate your prayers. Uh, She's just been helping out some family friends uh, with an emergency. But I am still excited to be here with you guys. I know that you guys get the worst end of the deal because she is my better half. Uh, But I will try to make up for it with energy and excitement this evening. If you don't mind opening your Bibles to Psalm chapter 142, Psalm 142, I uh, am super excited. I've been on deputation for uh, about 16 months now. This is my 16th month. And God has already provided us with uh, about 75% of our support. So God has been really, really good to us. And so we should be leaving in about six months. We're getting our uh, visa application process started now, and so we should be leaving uh, pretty uh, shortly. But I want to tell you a little bit about a story of grace known as my own testimony. I'm going to give you a little bit of time for questions after my ministry video, but let me just brag on God for a little bit, just talking about what he did in my life. Because you see, my life is very, very crazy, uh, what has happened in it. I really didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up uh, thinking nothing about Africa. I didn't think about being a missionary there. Never thought about even visiting it. Whenever I thought of Africa, I thought of cannibals stirring you over a fire. I thought of lions jumping out and eating you. Like, that's what I thought Africa was. Uh, But growing up, I really wasn't even interested in the things of God. I grew up in a very wicked and sinful home. Uh, The truth is, is that the love that my mom had for alcohol and drugs... That love for sin, it destroyed our family. Uh, My mom and dad were divorced uh, from a very young age, uh, whenever I was uh, just a couple years old. And my older brother and I grew up with my mom. And as we lived with her, I can remember constant fear, constant dread and wickedness. And it was all because of sin. I mean, we know that sin destroys. And that's exactly what it did to my family. It destroyed our family. But I remember growing up and some of the most exciting times were uh, just going to my grandparents' house, knowing that I'd be away from all the abuse, all the alcohol and drugs, uh, being away from all the uh, abusive boyfriends that my mom would bring home. I can remember going, uh, some of the most fearful moments were just getting dropped off uh, from the bus from school and having to open up my own door, not knowing what was behind it, whether it was a good day or a bad day. That's the kind of life that I grew up in. I grew up in a very sinful, wicked house, and it was because of the love for sin. But I remember one day, as I'm living in this house, my great aunt, she invited me to a vacation Bible school. And whenever that happened, I was not a church kid. I didn't know what vacation Bible school was. I thought it was just school, but for night. And I don't know what six-year-old boy you think like school, but I sure did not. So I was like, Aunt Lori, I don't want to go to school. I go there five days a week. Why would I want to go more? And she was like, Chase, there's going to be candy and Coke. And I was like, you got me sold. I'm going to vacation Bible school. So I went to vacation Bible school, just a program for kids so that they could get the gospel to them. And every night they taught uh, the gospel. And so every night I became convicted. I knew that I needed to turn away from my sin. I needed to repent of it. And I needed to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. But I did not want to. I had a conviction upon me and I did not like that feeling. I mean, I, I was trying to be callous towards feelings. And so anything that hurt, I mean, that conviction hurt me because I knew that I was on my way to hell. I didn't want it. So I became the class clown. I just started making jokes. Night after night, I made jokes until the very last night. And as I'm there, a mega church, probably 600 kids in this event, I decided to make one more joke. They gave the invitation and they said, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to raise your hand. And conviction came upon me. I knew that I needed to accept Jesus as my Savior, but I didn't want to. So I puffed out my chest to make light of the situation, and I yelled out, well, who's Jesus? And so I, made, I, I felt a little bit lighter until an older gentleman from the back starts walking up to me. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be the first kid to get banned from this church. I'm super nervous at this point. So I'm just like holding my head down, hoping he didn't see me. But he came straight up to me. And he said something that changed my life forever. He said, come with me and I'll tell you who Jesus is. He took me out into the hallway and he shared with me through the book of Romans who God was. 
He started sharing with me through scripture how God, a loving God, loved me in spite of my sin, in spite of my wickedness, in spite of who I was and how he commended his love toward me. And that even though I was a sinner, he died for me. He died on the cross for my sins. And that night, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And it was amazing. God blessed all because of that local church in my life. And that's why I deemed the local church as one of my heroes. It really is my hero because it was through the local church that I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was through the local church that my life changed forever. But you see, after that, I still had to go back into the pit of fear and dread and darkness known as my own household. And as this happened, my mom's alcohol addiction became worse and worse. The next three years drug by. My mom started using our grocery money on alcohol. Uh, she started, the verbal abuse started becoming physical. And it got to the point to where my brother and I had to get the law involved. This wasn't the first time welfare had been involved in our lives, but it was the last as they deemed my mom unfit for taking care of us. So as that happened, uh, I was put into my second cousin's home temporarily. My second cousin was, uh, we're from North Georgia. Uh, I'm proud to call myself a redneck. Like, I, I don't really care about it. But they gave me good redneck rules. Uh, and that's why I say that, because they said, uh, just call us Aunt Amy and Uncle Mark, uh, since we're so much older than you. Uh, and so they just did that out of respect. So I always called them Aunt Amy and Uncle Mark. But they gave us uh, some rules, and obviously we can't eat all of their food, because otherwise they won't have food and stuff like that. But they gave us a really important rule. They said, Chase, you got two options. You can go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursday night, because that was our service times. Or option number two was, I can beat you half to death. <laughs> so guess which one I did? I went to church. It was awesome. I went to church, and I started, uh, started being discipled. I started going, and uh, my children's church pastor took me under his wing. I was only nine years old, but he started sharing with me through the word of God who God really was in depth. You see, I realized that salvation was not the end of my Christian walk. It was the beginning. I realized that my God loved me so much that he didn't just die on the cross for my sins. He wanted a relationship with me, a personal relationship with me. You know, God was working in my life so that I could do his will and his pleasure. That's what Philippians 2.13 says. You know, uh, the Bible says that uh, the fa God is a father to the fatherless. You see, I started learning all these great things about, about who my God really was, and I fell in love with him even more. And as I'm living in this new house, what was supposed to be a temporary fix, uh, while my mom went through rehab, became a permanent situation. Because one day I get up and knock on my door, my uncle comes in and he says, Chase, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but your mom just passed away from an overdose. She took one more sleeping pill just to go to bed, but she had so many drugs in her system, she passed away into eternity. And that's whenever that became a permanent situation. But as that happened, uh, the Lord used it for good. About six months later, my uncle comes up to me, who's now my new adopted father. It's a little confusing, but uh, he's now my adopted father, Mark Coffey. And he comes up to me and he says, Chase, I've got some big news. He says, we're going to South Africa's missionaries. <laughs> I said, what? I, was like, I don't want to go to South Africa. I told you guys what I thought South Africa was. I mean, I told him, my grandparents used to tell me, Chase, finish your plate. There are kids starving in Africa. I thought if I went to South Africa, I was going to starve. Like, I'm like, I'm not having this. On top of that, I wanted to be the next NBA All-Star. And you can't play basketball very well in South Africa. So I started arguing with him. And on top of it, he started giving me all these rebuttals. But I told him, I thought I was going to Jesus juke him. I said, well, I finally got a church in the States that I'm growing closer to my God. I'm starting to learn who God was because of the Bible. Are you really going to take that away from me? I'm like, that'll get us to stay in the States. But he said something that changed my perspective like that. He said, Chase, there's people in South Africa that don't have Jesus like you do. I started realizing if they don't have Jesus, they're going to die and go to a real hell. I don't know about you, church, but I believe there's a real hell. So I started, I started getting excited. I was like, I can't live a life in the States for me, for myself, for my personal gain and comfort and success when God has called me to do something greater. I gotta, we all have to do what God has called us to do. God called my family to go to Africa. So I started getting excited about it. And so whenever we went over there, uh, I started hearing about all the fun stuff you can do there. 
30, 45 minutes from my house is the world's highest bungee bridge. And so you can go with me over and jump off the world's highest bungee bridge. And for those of you shaking your heads no, you can still come over and I can push you off. And we'll have a good time either way. No, I won't push you off, but you're more than welcome to come. But you see, these fun excursions is not why we went to South Africa. It's because they needed to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's whenever we moved over there, my parents went through language school and we planted a church. And I was, I, we had nobody, uh, and so I became the children's church pastor at age 14. And so I just started knocking on doors, started going around and meeting people, learning the culture, learning about who these people were. And I realized that my testimony is not as unique as I thought. If you look at Psalm 142 with me in verse 4, this is kind of depicting what my life is like or was like and what their lives are like. Psalm 142 in verse 4 says this, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. You know, this is kind of how I felt like growing up. I felt like nobody cared about me. My mom, she cared more for a drink than she did me. My dad was out of the picture. My uncles weren't in the country. I didn't know that they cared about me. Later to find out, that's actually my team in South Africa. But at the time, I didn't feel cared about. I felt like there was nothing in this world for me. My own house was a place of fear. I mean, that's not a refuge. That refuge failed me, as the psalmist said. But I looked up in this life, and I, as I felt like nobody cared about me, I went to a, a Baptist church, and they told me about a God who cared for me when nobody else did. You see, that's why I deemed the church as my hero. But you see, then I go to South Africa, and I realize that their, their culture is engulfed with alcohol and drugs. They're living, in life, living life just like I did. You know, nine out of ten of them don't even know who their biological parents are. Their refuge constantly fails them. One of our biggest things in the States is, is security. But they don't have that. South Africa has one of the highest crime rates in the world. I, working in these poverty areas where we do, I've been out at gunpoint. I've been out at knife point probably 15 times. They say that one in every four men in these poverty areas is involved in rape sometime in their lives. You see, refuge constantly fails them. So they have nothing going for them in this life. And as they're living in these 10 shacks, nine or 10 people to a one bedroom home, half of them don't have electricity, the other half don't have plumbing. As they're living in these places where refuge is failing them, they don't feel like nobody cares about them. They're looking up in this life, looking for somebody to love them. But the one difference between my life and theirs the one difference is that I had a local church in my life to tell them about that God who cared for their soul. But they don't. So they continue trusting in their animism, their ancestry worship, sacrificing animals to atone for their sins. They think that that is the way to heaven. They think that is the way to have a caring God love them. The reason that they don't know about the true gospel is because they don't have churches there to plant it. So I believe that's why my wife and I have been led there to South Africa. Because they needed more churches to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. My wife and I are super excited about going. We're going to learn a fancy language. Um, it's really intimidating. It's a clicking language called Kosa. I grew up around it so I, I can get by, but I need to learn it. But just to give you an idea of what this is, John 3.16 in this language is this. Amen? Speaking in tongues tonight. I'll translate. I'll interpret. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
I'm so grateful for a God who has given us scripture so that we could know who he was and what he did for us. I'm so grateful for a God who loved the entire world that he gave the gospel not only to the United States, but to all of the world. I'm so grateful that God has given South Africa a big opportunity because they have not only the gospel translated into their language, but the entire word of God. You see, it's a big opportunity because people are searching for the one true God. and That's why they're very religious. They have the entire Bible translated into their language. But the problem that still stands is the lack of churches. So I ask that you prayerfully consider helping us get there. We're super excited about going. We're willing. We just need help getting there. So we're going to watch the ministry presentation video right now. And after it, I'm going to give you opportunity to ask questions. And if you have none or after that, we'll get into the Word of God this evening. Uh, But please prayerfully consider helping us get there to South Africa. I was exposed to South Africa very early in life. The Lord has actually led my wife and I back to South Africa to reach the world with the gospel, starting with the Xhosa people. Let me tell you what I watched God do with my family growing up. The Lord actually led my adopted family there to South Africa to plant a church. We went there into the darkness of the world to shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We began worshiping with only our family in a small church building. And it went from there and God blessed it to where we had a full-blown church. But still, there's a major problem. The gospel of Jesus Christ is still unheard of to the majority of South Africa. They need more churches to be planted to where they can preach the gospel and disciple believers. When you go to Google and you Google South Africa's religion, it's going to say the majority is Christian. This is deceitful and far from the truth. You see brokenness. You see false religions intertwining with the traditional beliefs. They believe in something called ancestry worship. They trust in their ancestors as mediators. So what they'll do is they'll sacrifice animals and they'll pray to their dead relatives, hoping that one day they can go to God and put a good word in for the living. This is their hope, but it's hopeless. Because as the Bible says, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that man is Christ Jesus. We were called to a mission, a great commission, to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we believe that the world can be reached in our generation. We believe that every single person should be able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ before they die. But false religion is deceiving people from knowing the one true God. Thankfully, God has allowed South Africa to be open to missionaries coming in. We desire to go preach the gospel, to plant churches, and to evangelize the lost. But we can't do it by ourselves. And let me tell you, God has not only called my wife and I to reach South Africa, but each and every one of you Christians as well. You may be listening to this where you're seated and thinking, how am I supposed to reach the world with the gospel? And I would tell you, you can send my family on your behalf. So as you are reaching your community with the gospel and you are sending us to South Africa, it is just as if you are going to South Africa as well. And so when we preach the gospel to the men of South Africa and the families of South Africa, that is just as if you are as well. And that fruit can abound on your account. You can reach South Africa with the gospel if you would send us on your behalf. South African lives are at stake and they need your help. We need you to first of all beg for laborers. The Bible says that the harvest is great but the laborers are few and I tell you that that stays true in the country of South Africa. God is still blessing the ministry. People are still getting saved but the team down there in South Africa is just a drop in the bucket in comparison to the population. They need more missionaries there to preach the gospel and secondly I ask that you prayerfully consider making a financial investment. Would you consider supporting us monthly to where we can go to South Africa and reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Your monthly support would directly impact the lives of South Africa. You can make a great impact in South Africa and an even greater impact in eternity. Well, as you can see, I'm really excited about getting there to South Africa. 
God has really blessed the ministry down there. And I know growing up, I really didn't have much family, uh, but God has provided to where my team down there is my adopted parents, as well as my two biological uncles. And so I've got a, I've got a team situated down there. God has already provided us with 10 church plants going on right now. We've got a camp ministry that goes all year round. My uh, one uncle has started a primary school and is now starting a high school so that we can train up people academically to where they can have a good ed- education, to where they can read and write and study the Word of God. And we've also got a Bible college training up those uh, young men to take over churches and to plant new ones. So God is really blessing. Does anybody have any questions about either my life, my wife, or South Africa? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that, uh, that all started with uh, my other family. So my one uncle has been there since 2006, uh, but I got over there in 2013. So I was there for five and a half years, uh, but this is, this is the whole team. This is not just me. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Lord is, he's doing something big over there. That's why I can't wait to get over there because he's just, he's working and I just want to get into it. But yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it was uh, it was colonized by the British. They are yes, sir. So there's a big population. Uh, one of the pastors down there is pastoring a church in town. It's a mixed church, but he's an Afrikaner. He's of Dutch descent, and his family, along with uh, he, doesn't know of any missionaries going to the Afrikaans people. And so one of my little cousins is actually praying about doing that. He speaks Afrikaans fluently. So hopefully we'll get one, uh, one laborer going to them. But we do have a lot of missionaries in the cities. Uh, and in those cities is where the white population is. So they are more reached than the, the black uh, South Africans, but they're still not reached. They're not reached at all. So the entire country of itself really does need the gospel. That's a great question. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Where does Europe yes, that's a great question. So I'm not going to live in a tin shack. So there's an extremes in South Africa. So we'll live in the city. And in the city, we've got Burger King, we've got KFC. They actually thought KFC started in South Africa. Not argue with them, but it's useless. But it's first world country in the cities. So we'll have giant malls with ice skating rinks. We'll have soccer fields, and we'll have a three-bedroom uh, comfortable house with sometimes a pool in the backyard or whatever, just like the United States. Uh, but you'll drive five minutes, ten minutes, and then you'll end up in these poverty areas. So it's super close. I'll be 15 minutes away from where I'd like to start my first church plant. So it's not far at all. Uh, but that's, that's how we're going to live. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I did. That's a great question. So I came back uh, to uh, the Our Generation Training Center. It's the missionary training center out of my home uh, mission board. And uh, my wife was attending my home church at the time. And so I swooped her up, and she said she rejected me. And then I just kept trying and trying and trying. And I finally convinced her. And so uh, she got married to me. Yes, sir. And now we've been married for a little over a year. So we are professionals. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Any other questions? No? All right. Oh, well, if you don't mind opening your... Did I see a hand? No? All right. Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1 with me this evening. Philippians chapter 1 is an exciting passage, and that's why I love uh, preaching this. This is one of my favorite passages. Paul is just an amazing example uh, that we should follow. Uh, because his whole life is about, uh, is about the Lord. It's about what God has called him to do. I mean, whenever we think about Paul, we think of the great missionary, the great apostle Paul, who has done something great for God. And that stays true in this uh, passage as well. But we have to understand about what has been happening in this passage. Whenever he writes the book of Philippians, we know he's a very joyous author, right? He writes this book on joy. But how... 
could Paul have written a book on joy in the midst of his circumstances? I mean, do you guys remember what has happened to him? I mean, he has been falsely uh, accused. He's been falsely imprisoned. He's been humiliated and mocked and beaten on countless occasions. I mean, this guy has been through it all. And right now he's sitting there waiting on trial whether or not he's going to live or die. And yet he writes a book on joy. How could that happen? You know, if I was in a situation, you know what I'd be doing? I'd be writing a, a prayer letter to this church and I'd be like, guys, please pray I get out of here, right? I'd be praying to God saying, God, get me out of here. I need some Chick-fil-A and some Taco Bell. I need some good comforts, right? Because what do we as a Christians tend to do? We tend to focus on ourselves when bad things happen. We focus on our comfort. We po- focus on all these things that are happening to us instead of focusing on what Paul has focused on in this passage. You see, my dear friends, I want to challenge you to focus on what Paul is focused on to refocus on furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ and furthering, uh, focusing on the Lord. You see, in Philippians chapter 4, Paul says what? He says, rejoice in who? The Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He doesn't say rejoice in, in your situation or rejoice in your success or how great your life is going. No, he says rejoice in God. But then in Philippians chapter 1, he gives us something else that he is actually focused on. And It's in verse 12. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, he says this. He says, so that my bonds, or excuse me, but I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul says, look guys, fellow Christians, as he's writing this missionary update letter, missionary prayer letter, he says, look, I want y'all to understand something. All these things that have happened to me, All those adverse things have happened for one solid reason. He says it's to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. My dear friends, that's what our focus needs to be tonight. On furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray before we get into the rest of this. Heavenly Father, thank you for being so good. Thank you for uh, this wonderful church. Thank you for the pastor. I know that all these people have been sweet to me. Uh, They've been very, very encouraging. And I know that that reflects the leadership here. God, please, please bless the pastor and his wife and the rest of this church, Lord. But most of all, God, as we're getting into the word, your word, Lord, allow us to be doers of it. Allow us to make decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. Every time we get into the word of God, as we hear scripture, there is a decision to be made. And tonight, that decision is to focus on furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul, as he's writing this I mean, we think about it. Paul's attitude doesn't come out of nowhere. It starts somewhere. And I think it starts with the Gospels. I mean, I think it starts with how a loving God sent Jesus Christ down to this world. And as Jesus Christ lived on this world for 33 years, he he lived a perfect, sinless life. And yet what happened? He was crucified. And as he was crucified, he was dying on that cross, not not for himself, but for our sins, the sins of the whole world. And as he did that, as a loving God, known as the Son of Man, died on the cross for our sins, what happened? He said, it is finished. He died, and three days later, he rose again from the dead, defeating death. Right? I mean, this is exciting stuff. This is the answer to all of our sin. But then, right before he ascends up into heaven, he gives one last final command, the great commandment, known as what? The Great Commission, he says, go into the world and tell them about me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is where Paul's heart starts. And just to give you a great, crazy analogy, maybe this will stick with you. But you know, Pastor here, he is a very awesome, uh, very sweet uh, man. And he loves, loves you guys. I can just tell by the way he greets you guys. But let's say one day Pastor wants to do a surprise for you guys. So as he takes you guys out for a retreat, he says, you know, I want, this, I want this church building to get painted. But Pastor already told me he is not a painter. He hates painting. So you know what he does? He calls up cheap labor. He calls my phone number. Uh, you know, as Baptist missionaries, cheap labor. I'm just kidding. But he says, hey, Chase, I want to do something for my church. Would you mind coming over here, painting my church just a, a nice, solid gray? I was like, sure, I would. I'd love to do that. I mean, it'll look good with a church. 
So all of you guys go out on a retreat, and for day one, I start prepping everything. I start taping everything down, covering all the carpet, don't want to get paint anywhere. And so I start painting day two. Day two, I start painting, and I'm starting to get a little bored. I'm not really a painter. I'm, I mean, I want to go out and tell people about Jesus, but I'll paint anyway. But I start painting the back wall, and I'm getting bored. I don't know if it's ADD or what, but I get distracted, and I'm thinking, how could I make this more lively? I mean, this is just a gray, right? How could I make it more lively for the pastor and for the church? I start thinking, you know, my little sister Addison, she loves unicorns. So you know what I do? I go to Home Depot and buy neon pink and purple paint. And I start painting unicorns on the church auditorium. Woo, this is going to look good. It's going to look lively. Pastor's going to love it. It's really going to make this church pop. It's going to be unique, right? But Saturday night comes. 9 p.m., uh, service is next day with all of you guys here. Pastor walks in, and he is a nice guy, but I can just see the steam coming out of his ears. And he is like, what is, why are there unicorns on my walls? Why are there unicorns at the church auditorium? Chase, I gave you a simple task. Just paint the walls gray. Why is there pink and purple on my walls? I gave you a simple task, and you couldn't do it. You know, that's a very silly example. But that is our Christian lives a lot of the times. You see, God has given us a simple task. To go into the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet, a lot of the times, we find ourselves painting unicorns. We get distracted with things of this world. With things that we might think are lively for the Lord. But my dear friends, if we are not doing what God has commanded us to do, then we are doing a disservice. You see, it's time to be focused on the task at hand, to get the gospel to the world. And I'm telling you, this gets exciting because Paul, he's focused on this in this missionary prayer letter, this update letter as he's updating this church. And what does he say in verse 13? He actually starts talking about how God is blessing the ministry down there. And so he says this, he says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So he's saying, look, guys, my focus is on furthering the gospel. So as I am in prison, I'm not saying, guys, get me out of here. I'm not focused on my well-being. Instead of this, I'm focused on getting the gospel to the world. He actually saw his chains as an advantage to getting the gospel around the world. I mean, in Ephesians 6, he brags about it. But if you go up and you study up on the Romans, on the guards, every couple of hours, they would change their shifts. And so they would be chained up to him for hours at a time. So instead of saying, God, get me out of here, he's like, hang on. I'm chained up to this man here, and I'm chained up to this man here. You mean to say, I can preach the gospel, and they can't run away from me. So he just starts telling people about Jesus. He's being bold about it. He's telling these people that Jesus is the way to heaven. And he's not, he doesn't care about what's going to happen to him. He's not focused about his own self. He's focused on their eternal souls. So he's saying, guys, listen up. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Jesus rose again. Jesus is God. Trust in Jesus. He's telling them about the gospel of Jesus Christ and what Jesus did. And people are hearing it. People are getting saved. People are, I can imagine people getting saved. I can imagine him preaching and teaching and nobody caring about what he's saying, but he's doing it nonetheless. I mean, we remember the jailer got saved, right? I mean, Paul is just writing this and he says, look guys, by the end of me being bold, what's happened? Christ has been manifest or made known in the palace and in all other places, meaning the gospel of Jesus Christ is getting out. But not only that, but look at verse 14. This gets exciting because not only is Paul doing it, because remember, one man can't reach the whole world with the gospel. It's just not physically possible, I don't think. But, I mean, all things are possible with God, but look at this. Paul was really smart. He got other people encouraged by it. Look at verse 14. He says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. These people see Paul's situation. They see he is put in jail. And what happens? He goes up underneath their chairs. He takes a little lighter and he starts lighting a fire underneath these guys. Right? He takes that fire. And these guys are like, if Paul can do it, I guess I can too. I need to go and tell people about Jesus. 
Oh man, Paul is seeing people saved even in jail. Oh man, I need to go and tell people about Jesus. By the end of it, Paul is so bold, his boldness was contagious, and he got a whole group of people to start going out and telling people about Jesus. You know what that tells me? That tells me that boldness is contagious. But what are we bold about? What do our lives scream? You know, I am a very big uh, college football fan. I'm a Georgia Bulldog, so in your face. No, I'm just kidding. But I would go and I'd be in South Africa, and I'd wake up at 2 or 3 a.m. just to watch the game. I mean, we loved, we loved doing that. We loved watching college football. But as silly of an example as it is, how many more times do we talk about a silly football game than we do the gospel of Jesus Christ? That ought not be so. Because, my dear friends, a silly football game does not save souls. See, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul realized that. He realized how vital the gospel was. So with everything in him, he's preaching the gospel, and he's getting other people to preach the gospel too. Your boldness is contagious by what you're bold about. If you're bold about college football, what are other people going to talk about? You're going to start talking about college football. But my dear friends, if you're bold about Jesus, if you are going around telling people about Christ, if you're going to your friends and your fellow Christians and you're telling them, hey, we need to go and tell people about Jesus, what's going to happen? We're going to have a whole army of people going out to the world and reaching this world with Jesus. Imagine if each and every one of us were as bold as the Apostle Paul. Wouldn't you think that this world would be reached with the gospel? Ooh, I could see God doing a big work. I think that's why God is doing a big work all around the world. Because there are individuals becoming bold and it's causing teams to be bold. And it's causing a lot of Christians to be bold. I want that for everywhere. I think that God wants that for everywhere because God is not willing that any should perish. But that all shall come to repentance. He wants the world to be saved. But he wants to use you to do it. Will you be bold enough to take the gospel to the world? If you do, God will bless and people will be saved. And then as you look at this, go ahead and look at verse, verse 20. And this is probably where we're going to end is in verse 20. But Paul, he is a spitfire. He is not ashamed of the gospel. And now we're getting into Christmas time here in December. This right here, verse 20, is Paul's Christmas wish list. I mean, if you gave him a little magazine and you told him circle the toys that you want, he's going to circle this verse right here and he's going to say, guys, with everything in my heart, my earnest expectation and my hope is this. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. With everything in Paul, he said this. I never, ever, ever want to be ashamed of Jesus. I never want to be ashamed of him. Because you realized how vital the gospel was. Imagine if he was ashamed. We know that jailer would never have found Christ. We know Christ would not have been made known or manifest in the palace and in other places, like verse, verse 13 says. We know a fire would not have been lit underneath his fellow Christians. You see, he realized there was too much at stake for him to be ashamed of Jesus. Sure, it would have been more comfortable. He probably wouldn't have been in jail if he was ashamed of Jesus. He probably would not have been mocked and humiliated if he was ashamed of Jesus. His life probably would have been more comfortable. But he said, look, it's not about my comfort. It's not about my success. It's about getting the gospel to the world. So he says with everything in him, he's going to be bold. But that with all boldness as always, Christ shall be magnified or made known, made big in my life, so big that everybody in the world could see him. That's what he wants. That's his deepest, darkest desire was to magnify Christ in his body. Because he realized how vital the gospel of Jesus Christ was. Do we know how vital the gospel of Jesus Christ is? You know, in order to finalize my training to become a missionary, I had to spend six months in a foreign mission field. 
South Africa wasn't really foreign uh, since, I guess, whenever you live there five and a half years, they say it's not very foreign to you. But I went to Peru, South America. I thought I was actually going to be a missionary there. Uh, but whenever I went there, the uh, Lord called me to South Africa. But whilst being there, I still had a heart for those people. I always have a heart for people because I know that God has a heart for those people. The closer that you get to the heartbeat of God, the, the closer you hear the, the soul's of the world. But as I go to South Africa, or I'm sorry, South America, and I start going over there to Peru, I'm thinking, I gotta get the gospel of these people. But there's one problem. I don't speak a lick of Spanish. And I sat, I mean, I look like a giant white dude, and I stick out like a sore thumb. So I go over there to this, uh, this place, and I'm thinking, how am I gonna learn the language? Start going through language school. But there's an apart, I lived in an apartment. There was a park behind my house. About 30 guys my age playing soccer. And whenever I'm going there to that park, I kid you not, I go over there and I'm thinking, I got to get the gospel out. So I, I go up to him and I go, hola, como estas? And I sound like a giant white dude. I, I'm not kidding. The reason I know is because the 30 guys playing soccer stop in their tracks. I mean, the ball is still going. They stop in their tracks, look at me, and they start laughing at me. And I'm like, how, what did I get myself into? But I started going there more and more. I started learning the language, being able to invite people to church, and I started bribing people like I was for VBS. Candy and Coke, pizza and Coke. I said, come out to lunch with me and I'll tell you about Jesus. And they're like, sure, I love pizza. I love Papa John's. So I went and I started sharing the gospel with some of them. A lot of them started coming to church. Uh, my roommate, uh, he bought a 1987 Volkswagen Beetle. And we fit 11 people into that thing to bring to church. It was awesome. I mean, we felt like it was going to break it in half, but that was okay because people were coming to church, right? God was blessing. But I remember one of those young men. His name was Luis Fernando. And Luis was a devout Catholic, but I bribed him to come out to eat with me. I shared John 3.16 with him. I shared the gospel with him. Porque de tal manera amó Dios al mundo que ha dado a su hijo unigénito para que todo aquel que no cree no se pierda, mas tenga vida eterna. I started sharing the gospel with Luis Fernando. He ended up coming to church. He got connected with some of the guys, and he got saved. It was amazing. God blessed. But what happened afterwards really shook me. Because I, start, I saw him about a week later, and I started walking with him. I asked him how he was doing, and he was suffering with depression. I was like, this is odd. I mean, whenever you get saved, you're not supposed to be pretty, pretty down. But he told me, you know, Chase, a couple weeks before you met me, my best friend committed suicide. He said his best friend was a, he was a devout Catholic. I was like, oh man, I'm so sorry. And he said, you know, Chase, since he was out of this world, I felt like there was nothing left in it for me. So I was going to do the same thing. And then he said, but then you took me to church and I met Jesus. You see, we don't know when people are going to die. You could die at any moment. If we were not bold enough to have told him about Jesus Christ, he'd be in hell for all of eternity. But I could say the same thing for a lot of people around here. See, if we are not bold enough, then that's other people's lives at stake. My dear friends, we do know today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get the gospel around the world. So with everything in Paul, he says, I want to be bold about Jesus. I want to get the gospel to the world. That was his only focus. His one sole focus was on furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this tonight. Where is your focus? Where is our focus in this life? And I want to challenge you, if it is not on the furthering of the gospel, if it's not on the Lord, I want, I want to challenge you to change it. Because lives are at stake. It's time to stop painting unicorns. And stop, start getting furthering the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today and thank you for this church. Please bless them. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to have shared your word. 
Lord, if there's people in here tonight that have not been focusing on you, Lord, and your furthering of the gospel, Lord, help them to refocus on you. I give you praise for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.